one. Here we go. Let me see. So, hi everyone. I just need to see that everything works. Um, welcome to the 22nd edition of On Data and Design. My name is Darian. Um, I'm the co-founder of Superdot, and I'm the co-author of the book, which was released this year. It's called Visualizing Complexity, and I'm the initiator of On Data and Design. And tonight, I'm your host, as usual, and we will have three talks, and we will talk about visual data activism. So it's my pleasure to introduce Federica, Angeles, and Mushan. Um, Federica and Angeles are joining from Italy and Mushan from Tel Aviv, from Israel. All our speakers will have 20 minutes to, for the talks. And during the talks, you can ask questions. We have Slido, there is the link below in YouTube. So you can write your questions. You can upvote questions if they're interesting. So we can have some participation. And after the three talks, after the three times 20 minutes, we will have a conversation trying to answer your questions. And uh, long story short, we are already getting there. So our first speaker is Federica. And I would ask you, Federica, to introduce yourself and tell us something about visual data activism. Sure. Thank you for having me and hi, everyone. OK. I hope you can see my screen. Great. So uh, my name is Federica Pragapane, and I'm an information designer, and I work as a freelancer designing data visualizations. And in the past few years, uh, I've collaborated with different magazines and organizations. I worked with BBC, Sense Focus, uh, Google, United Nations, uh, the Scientific Magazine, Scientific American, and I also collaborated with La Lettura, that is a cultural supplement of the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera. And the range of complexity that characterizes my projects can be very broad according to the needs, the usage context and the readers, and also the levels of experimentation that I use. But in general, what I'm interested in to exploring is this communication, uh, this connection, communication connection that the data visualization piece can create uh, with the people it talks to. I'm particularly interested in exploring this connection and in, in this communication, exploring this communication process. And as I was mentioning, many of my projects have an experimental approach and they allowed me to uh, mix visual experimentation and a sense and on a deep care for aesthetics and meaningful contents, of course, at the same time. And the role of aesthetics uh, as a significant aesthetics as a significant role in my uh, approach to designing data visualizations. I don't work with deep care on the aesthetics of my pieces just because I like pretty things, even if I enjoy <laughs> looking at pretty things. Uh, but it's because for me, it's really part of this communication process I want to work on. I really want to invite the readers into looking at my pieces, into exploring them when the usage context allows it. So there are cases in which I know that I can work on complex pieces with a certain level of experimentation, maybe because the usage context is characterized by a slow reading process, for instance. But anyway, this is just to talk about the role of the shapes and the forms that I'm using. And this is also something that I'm going to talk about uh, now. Uh, for me, designing data visualizations is really an act similar to the writing one. Uh, I'm writing with visual alphabets and often also experimenting uh, with new visual letters. And I think that as in writing, also in data visualization, the choice of visual words as a role in communicating stories. Um, and I want to show you some examples and how, for me, design data visualizations can really help in communicating topics. And for me, how uh, the form of my visual words has uh, a meaningful role in to do it. So to show you a first example, a first example, I collaborated with Scientific American, the Scientific 
magazine. And there is something that I really love about this collaboration is the fact that when Scientific American proposed me to visualize the topic, they don't not, don't, not only send me the, the material, the data for the visualization itself, but also contextual papers and information that could be interesting uh, in connection with the subject I'm talking about. And some years ago, they contacted me asking me to visualize the menstrual cycle, visualizing it. And apart from all the actual data that then I visualized, they also sent me a very interesting paper. It was this one, the menstrual cycle, a feminist lifespan perspective. And the paper mentioned um, how the stigma and the taboo that in media and in communication uh, surrounded and still surrounds the topic and how, for instance, uh, in movies, in media, the, 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 the subject of menstruations was historically, historically connected with something ugly and dirty, uh, ugly to look at. And reading this paper meaningful, meaningfully influenced my approach to the project because I really wanted to work on something aesthetically pleasing also uh, in contrast with the taboo and with that stigma. So uh, I want to show you in this case quickly the project. So the project shows the menstrual cycle, the variables involved and their connection. And I really worked in this case deeply with deep care on the aesthetic of it, influenced by the paper and by uh, the role of the aesthetics of the forms that I'm working with. And there is a few years ago, a potential clients of mine described my visualizations using these terms, fragile languages. And I really, I really love it. I really love the description actually. And it allows me to talk about fragility. And the fragility is not only the fragility of the ships that I'm using, but I think also the data fragility. And I think it, that as a data visualization designer is an important subject to, to talk about. I'm going to show you another example. So 25th of November is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And a couple of years ago, I wanted to create something uh, thinking about this, uh, this day, this, 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 annual, this uh, annual day, this international day. And as I often do, I often propose the topics when I work with clients. In this case, it was just a personal project, side project without any commission. I looked online for data sets. Uh, so my own language is visualizing data. So when I want to talk about a subject, I usually look for data about such subject. And in this case, I use a source, the OECD, um, and I visualized the topic of the prevalence in the lifetime. So the percentage of women was suffered from uh, sexual abuse from an intimate partner in a moment of their lifetime. And so this was the data set that I was starting from the source and the source provided the data for all the world's countries, almost all the world's countries. And in this case, I wanted to create a pretty straightforward yet uh, organic representation and I use these shapes made of curved red lines in which each curved line shows 1%. So the number of the of red lines shows the percentage of women who have experienced physical and or sexual violence from an intimate partner at some time in their life. And then I visualize the data for all the countries that the data sets provided. Uh, and then I posted it online on my, on my social media in this case. As I was mentioning, it wasn't for a client. And this topic and this project allows me to talk about the fragility. So those shapes are fragile because of different reasons. First of all, because of the fragility they are telling. Uh, so the stories, the human fragility behind them. But then because those data are fragile too, because a number such as the prevalence of violence, the number of women were suffered from, suffered from uh, sexual or, or physical violence from an intimate partner. Of course, it's not a number that you can count precisely. Maybe you can get very close, you can have an overall idea, but inevitably we are going to lose uh, hundreds of stories maybe. Uh, and I think that this is very important. I really believe in the communicative potential of visualizing numbers, but I think that it's important to have the intellectually honest, honesty and transparency and to declare that the data are fragile too, can be fragile too. Behind the data, behind my visualization, there is a human intervention and it's mine, but there is a human intervention behind data too. And I think that it's very important to declare it with uh, transparency and intellectual honesty. 
Yet, I still believe that visualizing such numbers, giving a shape to such stories can be a very good starting point for starting a conversation, helping people in discovering something new, talking about subjects, um, and also starting maybe a conversation about the missing data and the missing stories, for instance. So, of course, I still believe in uh, the role of visualizing this data and these stories. And again, coming back to the idea of visual words and visual alphabets, I was mentioning how the shape for me of visual words as a role in communicating stories. And I often use organic shapes, uh, and this is a definition of organic from Oxford languages relating to or derived from living matter. And I think that designing organic shapes helps me and hopefully also the readers in reminding the lives behind the data. I, mean, I often talk about data uh, that have human lives uh, behind them. As in this case, for instance, this piece was a data visualization designed for the online magazine Atmos. And it shows the patterns of violence for Brazil's land defenders. So the average proportion and number of environmental defender deaths in Brazil from 2015 to 2019 by state. And in this case, the clients uh, asked me to use my usual organic style to talk about these stories, reminding of the lives behind these numbers and behind this data. In talking about uh, organic shapes that have stories behind them, I want to talk about another project that is called Key Workers. So in 2020, I was contacted by ODI in March, April 2020. ODI is a think tank, and they were starting collecting the stories that you can see here in this screenshot. Stories of migrants essential workers' contribution to the COVID-19 response. And they were just starting collecting these stories as a personal initiative. And they created this data set that is still online and publicly available. And for each story, they um, added information on the geography, on the country, on the level. So if it was an initiative or uh, on a national, local, or regional level, the data set collects both stories of contribution, but also on the initiatives uh, supporting such contributions in a moment of crisis, uh, such as the first month of the pandemic, and, and, and not only that moment. And then other information, such as the sector, agriculture, or healthcare, for instance, plus other contextual data and information that can be helpful if added. And they contacted me because they had this very long data set, but they wanted to give it a shape because they thought it wasn't enough to communicate such stories. And they didn't want something uh, proving a point. They just wanted a website allowing the readers to explore these stories without a specific order, for instance. And this is why I worked on this project that it's called Key Workers. It's a website. I co-designed it together with Alex Piacentini, uh, who was an excellent uh, UX UI designer and also the developer. So he also developed the project. And it's the result of a collaboration with the ODI and ODI is Marco Foresti. And we created for each macro region a tree. And the larger branches show sectors from healthcare to, to agriculture. And the local and the smaller branches show different levels from national, regional, or local. And the idea was really the one of giving a shape to this idea, to this concept of growing our growing awareness of this contribution. So this is why I wanted to use the visual metaphor of the tree. That is a very simple visual metaphor, actually, but it's, again, a, an organic one. Uh, because I really wanted to give a shape of this concept, not only of growing contribution from coming from people who are in those countries, but the growing awareness, our growing awareness of these contributions. And the website allows to explore these stories. As you can see in the landing page, you can see all the trees, one for macro geographical area, and then interacting with them, uh, you can see the stories. And this, for instance, is an old screenshot because uh, this project was then updated and monthly, periodically. So now the trees are, are bigger. And, and they have more stories. And then clicking on them, clicking on the stories, clicking on the geographical region, you can see the tree uh, with the screen split into houses. On, on the left side, you can see the tree. And on the right side, you can see the map with the stories plotted on it and categorized by sector. 
And then, of course, clicking on the story allows to read it uh, and to also go to the original source. And so this was a project that I loved working on because it really uh, allowed me to also to show how data visualization can really help in showing hidden stories and in bringing them to life. So I want to talk about uh, another project quickly. Uh, and this is again connected to how I think the visualization can help us in visualizing stories and in bringing them to life. So uh, I worked on it a, a few years ago in 2016, but it's still one of the projects I'm most fond of. Uh, I started thinking about, it was 2016, Italian media talked a lot about asylum seekers arriving in Italy and the Mediterranean sea routes. And I started thinking about how long actually their travelings were and how few I knew about all that part that was before the Mediterranean route that is, yes, uh, extremely dangerous, but there are thousands of kilometres before that part often and hundreds of days spent travelling. And so I started to think about how I would have liked to use my competencies to, to talk about these journeys, uh, sharing people's experience. So I contacted a welcoming center, and this is how I met MB, SS, MG, AL, SG, and TK. There are six asylum seekers arrived in Italy in 2016. And, and we worked together on a project that is called The Stories Behind the Line. Uh, my idea was to give a perceivable shape to their life experiences and to their journeys. So I met them in the welcoming center they were hosted into. And with the help of Google Maps, we reconstructed the routes point by point. And for each point, I asked them always the same questions. How many days they traveled together, the transportation, and how many days they stayed there before moving to the following place. Plus, I added that I would have noted down any additional notes and comments that they would have liked to add to their narrative. And this data collection process, of course, is very different from the other ones I'm used to. But it's because I really wanted, in this case, to exit from the digital bubble and also to immerse uh, and to go out and to talk with the people who live the topic every day, because I think that data visualization can have a role, not only in communicating to people, but also in to uh, give a voice to people who don't have platforms. And it is an important concept for me. I was a little bit intimidated on the fact that I was deciding to deal with a very complex global topic and also painful stories, showing very simple and personal data. But this is because I really wanted to provide a simple, clean and personal and rational narrative of the topic, because I think that this is a topic that deserves a rational approach. And I think that a rational approach doesn't necessarily imply a lack of empathy. And after our meetings, I draw for each person a unique line shaped by the experiences. And uh, the in horizontal line show the days of traveling, blue for days of stays in the city, like blue for days spent traveling. And then I show the different transportation with the dashed lines. And the final project is a website. Uh, it's called storiesbeyondtheline.com. Also, this project is the result of a collaboration with Alex Piacentini. He's a colleague and also a very dear friend of mine. And he accepted to work on with me on this project that, again, has no commission. So we worked on it during the, the evenings, basically, and on the weekends. And in the landing page, you can see the six lines with the initials of the six narrators. And then interacting with them, clicking on them, you can see each single narrator's page. And I wanted each single story is very precious, and I wanted to uh, give their lines their own space, showing them at first as black path on a white background. And then interacting with them, you can see the day spent traveling, going over with the mouse, you can read the data, you can also read the transportation data. And then those red dots represent the moments in which the narrators decided to share some of their fragments from the stories and clicking on them allows to read them. Uh, in this case, they just when they want it and if they want it. So there are lines that have no red dots and it was completely fine, of course. And then I want to show the map behind the line, of course, that is very important. Uh, and clicking on the map allows to see it. But I want it to be a second step so you see the part within the circle is the Mediterranean Sea route, the one the Italian media most frequently mentioned, for instance. But I wanted to show all the part before that, that route. And I wanted it to be a discovery uh, from a user's perspective, a user's point of view. And I think that this can be a way to deal with global 
and complex topics as the migration one. I think that, of course, it's important to uh, talk about them uh, sh showing the big picture and visualizing big numbers and big data. But I think that also providing such small windows from which to explore the topics can help in having a deeper comprehension of it without losing sight of the humanities behind those stories and those data. Plus, as I was mentioning, I don't think that the rational approach implies a lack of empathy. And I think that the narrator's comments really helped me in a, in a, a very emotional and meaningful layer to the project. A beautiful comment is the one by SG, 26 years old boy from Pakistan, who told me my mind is quiet now. I'm quiet because I'm safe and that's why I love Italy. And another beautiful comment to see is from AL. He was 17 years old at the time. And he told me, you have a beautiful life here because you know that you're safe. So to conclude the talk, uh, let's move to today. Today, this is a tweet from a Iranian friend and colleague, Maral, and she tweeted today, today marks a critical day for Iranians. Um, Haz Amini died 40 days ago. Traditionally, we say our final goodbye on the 40th day after the passing of a loved one. And in this tweet, she's asking, people to be Iranian people voice, as you can read. And this is something that she's been doing for weeks, actually. And I was looking at their stories, her stories on Instagram some, some weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and, and I was following what was happening in Iran and looking at their stories in which she was asking people to talk about the subject. Uh, I started to think that I wanted to talk about the subject using my vision languages. And so I started to look for data because, again, this is how I usually talk about different topics. And this is the one data that I found. Uh, it was October uh, 2nd, and it was a data on the people who have died and been killed, actually, since the beginning of protests in Iran. And I decided to visualize the data with a very simple shape in which one line is, shows one person, and the shape recalls the braids, uh, thinking about the all these women who are fighting and were cutting their own hairs, their own braids, uh, as a sign of protest and rebellion. And I posted online, and I was really overwhelmed by the hundreds of comments that I received and how much it was shared. And hundreds of comments from Iranian people asking, again, uh, us and me to be their own voices. So unfortunately, I'm I'm updating these these visualizations because now the the numbers are growing. Uh, this was from October 12th, and I also had to add a data that the source provided. The data is a Iran human rights, um, and the data was on the, the children and teenagers killed. So I visualized this data adding white lines to to show this number to within the total number of people killed and this is the the last update i published it yesterday uh, i in this case i also added a black uh bright braid that fits into the background because i wanted to point out to the fact that those numbers only include the verified ones but there are again stories missing stories and and missing numbers that are still under investigation and yes, this is just one of the ways in which I want to use data visualization to, to talk about topics and, and subjects. And thank you much, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Federica, for your very elegant and very brave approach towards difficult topics. It's really nice. Um, I think it's going to be really hard for me sometimes today to say, okay, your time is over because I just would like to listen to you. Um, great. So please, for everyone, collect your questions. Use Slido. I see there are already some questions, uh, upvote questions. We will try to discuss them afterwards. And now um, I would love to hear the story from you, Mushan. So uh, please. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, works. Perfect. Okay, so I'm very, very happy to be here today. And thank you, Diane, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about the project that uh, is pretty new, uh, just launched uh, in September 1st, and uh, has been pretty dramatic in Israel. Um, you're going to to hear more about Israeli politics than you probably signed up for. So, um, so 
uh, brace yourselves. And I'll also say that because this issue is very uh, contentious, I will try to make sure that I'm not uh, saying things I regret. Um, but I'm a human, so um, that's not going to change uh, during this presentation. So the title of my talk is Where Are We? And it's actually a question or rather, the, rather three questions. So question one is where, question two is are, and question three is we. And that would be the structure of my talk as well. Um, just a few words. Um, my name is Mushan Zeraviv. Uh, I'm a designer based in Tel Aviv, uh, which rhymes, which makes it easier. Um, I'm, I have my own practice and I teach at Shankal College. And if you like following people, then uh, you can do that too. Um, okay, so this, this project and this issue is actually very, very personal and dear to me because I was growing up in Israel, which is to the east of the Mediterranean. Um, I grew up with a lot of maps around the house. Um, this is just like a few maps that, you know, were around and each one of them looked different and showed different information, but which is something that maps do, but, but each one of them actually showed different borders as well. And, um, and I had this weird experience that I, I felt like I'm missing something. I felt like I, you know, I, I was growing up and I didn't know what the borders of my country are. Like everybody is supposed to know where they are in the world. And like the, the country that, uh, that is, especially in a country like Israel, is a very a substantial part of your, of your identity. You're supposed to know where, where it is. Um, and I didn't know that. And I blamed myself uh, because I thought, you know, they taught us uh, that, but I just didn't listen. And, and by the time that I realized that I don't know it and I'm supposed to know it, I was too embarrassed to ask. Um, and, and it took me quite a few years to realize it's both not my fault uh, exclusively, um, and, uh, and I'm probably not the only one. So I, in 2005, I created this poster um, to reflect on the on this experience, on the on this um, on this confusion, on on this personal border conflict that is not only personal, apparently. And what I did is, I try to to write the index first, and I, and I wrote the index as as a palette. Um, I wrote all of the all of the borders that I could think of, all of the territory terms that I could think of, all of the all of the types of uh, of settlements and cities and 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 kind of indexes and and I tried to imagine if I had a daughter. Um, I didn't have children back then. Now I do have a daughter actually, um, and a son. But if I had a daughter, what would her experience be like? And, and I realized that um, she would probably grow up with the same border conflict that I've grew up with. And, and that, uh, that this border conflict is, is this so, something that really disturbs our sense of place, our understanding of where we are and who we are and, and, and who we're not. And um, and what is our relationship with the region that we're in? And uh, in 2000, and, and this poster was pretty well received when it came out in 2005. And um, and in 2018, 13 years later, I was uh, um, I, I was invited to to be I was interviewed about about this idea of education and maps. And um, uh, it's in Hebrew, so we're not going to watch it, but. Uh, uh, but we actually had this conversation during this uh, interview about about this map that that is painted on the floor 
uh, in my son's uh, school. And, uh, and the funny thing is that this map in a school um, has borders that were never the borders of Israel. There was it's a mix of a few borders together, and and I and I looked at that and said, okay, this is exactly this is exactly my border conflict. It's painted on the on the floor, and there's also someone who came and and painted the line uh, afterwards to to mark something on this on this map. So so th that was. And that video um, was published in TV and uh, and online, and uh, some people saw it. And apparently, I wasn't the only one um, who has some issues with the way we teach uh, where we are. Um, so this is Nir Gov, and he lives in Tel Aviv, like me. And um, and when his uh, daughter came uh, from school with this. Uh, uh, book, um, this official book uh, that teacher that, that, that they teach in Israel, he realized that in the book, in in the page that is titled "The Borders of the State of Israel," there's a map that doesn't show the the right borders of the state of Israel, um, and we'll get to that. Don't worry, um, I'll explain why. But uh, but he contacted uh, someone in the municipality, Moria Shlomot, um, and they tried to say, you, you know, you know, we can we should do something about the books. But first of all, we should also talk uh, do something about the maps that are are in the classes because the maps themselves are wrong. Uh, they're not actually showing the borders of Israel, which as you probably know, is a pretty contested issue. So there's a good reason why um, some people would want to show certain borders and others would want to show other borders. And, um, it, and you know, COVID happened and a lot of things happened and the project was pretty much stuck until um, Chen Arieli, the deputy mayor of Tel Aviv, who's like a power host that you can believe, uh, just took it on herself and kind of pushed it forward and just decided we are going to do it. The municipality is going to to fund the creation of of new maps um, that would be on every um, on every wall uh, in in every class in Tel Aviv. Um, and um, they saw the video uh, where I was interviewed about it, and they contacted me, did me which is like. You know, you do a you do a kind of a reflective poster, and you end up uh, getting the job. So that's kind of a nice uh, pro uh, story, in that sense. So, um, so we I promise that the structure is where are we? So let's start with where, and uh, and I'll explain why the poster is actually constructed from three maps. Um, this is usually where we look at the world now um, in um, digital maps. And what digital maps can do is they can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and we can see different zoom levels and we you can see different information as you zoom in and zoom out. And that is something that is very different than a printed map. Um, but this is a printed map in 2022. It cannot be um, something that that is not, you know, that, that that ignores uh, the environment it's in. Um, plus, if we're trying to answer the question, where are we? Um, there are quite a few answers, like we are in our city. Um, this is actually uh, focused on my neighborhood. And this is how we chose to represent it. So obviously on, on Google Maps, we can do, we can see a lot of information, but, uh, but here we want to see um, specific things for children. So, so the blue circles are uh, marks of the schools, and the pink ones are for uh, uh, municipality cultural centers. Uh, we marked every beach in Tel Aviv. We have a lot of them, and they're really nice. Uh, we marked the the um, um, the light rail that is currently being built, um, but uh, it's going to be opened. And so, so, so there is an element of anticipation here as well. Um, and we marked specific landmarks that would be relevant to children. So, so the idea is that they can look at the map and they identify, first of all, the school as kind of the, the 
pivot point for their their neighborhood, um, the home, and their uh, and and the actual environment that they experience by walking, uh, and and you zoom out and uh, and th this was the whole city, and you can see uh, this is the the top left corner. This is the zoom out map, uh, the zoom in map. Um, and also marking uh, the shape of Tel Aviv, the neighborhoods and everything. So if we zoom out a bit further, we, we can see that when we zoom out from, from uh, Google Maps, we see very little uh, in labels. And, but when we zoomed in, we saw every street and we, could, we, we can see every building, right? Uh, this is not something we, we can do in print. Um, so when I try to put... Um, on the on on the second map on the uh, state map, um, a, every label it looked like that. And actually, some some maps of Israel look pretty similar to that. They, they don't overlap, but you pretty much cannot see anything but labels. Um, so there was some there was a need to 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 make some room. Plus, another thing that was important for me is to to show. Uh, I actually rendered every street in the country. So every street, every small street and, and medium street is rendered in the in the map. So you can actually see this, the, the urban landscapes uh, or the, the urban uh, layouts of the cities. And you can see that, you know, some cities uh, like the one in the north over here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, um, but um, you, you can see that the streets are laid out in parallel to the to the beach. And uh, some cities are, we can see kind of the, the uh, metropolitan area of Tel Aviv. We, we, can, we, can, we can see smaller villages and we can see uh, that uh, across uh, borders, the layouts change. Um, so rather than show that, I, the, the, there was a need to, to work with hierarchies, to work with the, um, to, to, try, to try to see how, how can, how can we get the most of, out of the space, but not in the um, in the price of uh, of not seeing the the terrain and the um, and the urban terrain? Um, so so that way, when we when we look at Haifa, for example, uh, the city in the peak here, we can see that unlike in Netanya that we talked about before, um, the the streets in in Haifa actually uh, wrap themselves around uh, the mountain. Um, so, so, so we can really learn about the geography from the map, and because you know this is an educational map. That's uh, that's the idea. So, so that's that that was um, the map of Israel, and the, and uh, and and the third map would be the 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 biggest zoom out. And uh, in this case, we wanted to really answer where are we, um, and and we. Um, we we kind of uh, tilted uh, the map a bit to try to see um, a, a wider region, which we're going to talk about uh, a bit further. Um, so three maps connected like this, and I also to to fit into the format, I had to tilt the map eighteen uh, degrees, which uh, which uh, funny enough was one of the more controversial things that I've done in this map because people are not used to look at the map like that. Uh, but don't worry, there are more controversial things coming up. Um, so second question, R, and by R, I want to talk about where we are right now, the 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 present. So I'm going to talk about borders a bit. Um, this is a, this was the map of Israel since its founding, pretty much pretty much its founding until six, 1967, and uh, um, you can see that that there's this green line in, at the center uh, between the Jordan River and the sea, and this green line marked um, uh, the lines of the ceasefire uh, after the the war uh, that ended in forty nine. Um, and that and that stayed the unofficial but clear border of Israel until sixty seven. Until sixty seven, people pretty much knew the the shape of their country. Um, but then in sixty seven, Israel uh, fought uh, what we call uh, the six day war because it was only six days, 
um, and the world calls it the 67 war. Um, and a lot of things happened there. Um, Israel has grown and we need a bigger map for that. So, th so this was the shape of Israel before 67, but uh, after 67, Israel actually uh, conquered uh, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, the Gaza Strip, the East Jerusalem, um, the West Bank, and uh, the Golan Heights, all in six days, which uh, really changed the culture because people were like kind of uh, very happy about what the army can do um, and about the, the new powers and everything. And immediately Israel started to move not only soldiers into these uh, areas, but also civilians to populate these new areas. Now, um, the, another thing that Israel did is that um, the Golan Heights were annexed, um, made a part of Israel immediately. And the West uh, and West Jerusalem, um, the the little part that you can, can see here, was also not exactly annexed, but the but Israeli law has been uh, activated there on on both the space and the popula population. Um, now, in fast forward to 1979, Israel signs a peace accord, a, a, a peace agreement with um, Egypt stops moving people there, uh, removes the people and the, 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 the villages and cities from uh, Sinai and, um, and uh, pulls away from Sinai. Uh, that was the basis for uh, the, the peace uh, with Egypt. And that uh, made us, you know, uh, contract back to smaller um, area. Now, let's continue to 1995, in 1995, uh, it was also after the, the peace process with the Palestinians already started. And uh, the second uh, um, um, part of the Oslo Accords um, uh, basically said that, that Palestinians would get control of some of the area of the West Bank and all of the area of the Gaza Strip. Uh, at the beginning, it was part of the area of the Gaza Strip, but then all of it. Um, and and as you can see, uh, it, it is really patches, really, really patches uh, that were uh, built like that to make sure that uh, the Israeli settlements can still be there under Israeli control. Um, so if we continue to 2005, in 2005, Israel actually decides to stop moving people into the Gaza Strip um, and remove all, all, uh, all uh, settle, the settlers and the army bases from the Gaza Strip and uh, to unilaterally um, disconnect from the Gaza Strip, um, disengage. Um, and in, if, if we, but, but the West Bank is still on, right? We're, we're moving on, on to 2020, uh, 2020, sorry. Sorry, uh, in 2020, there were a lot of uh, talks about annexation, of annexing the West Bank, um, the parts that, you know, it wasn't clear um, if it would be annexing the whole thing or uh, just part of it, but um, the West Bank would be annexed and then, and uh, Trump was supposed to be supporting it. It ended up with um, the, um, um, the Abraham uh, agreements with uh, with uh, Arab countries that uh, were on the term that Israel doesn't annex that that space. So, so as you can understand, um, there are some issues, and they go on. Uh, we have elections next week. Um, the borders are very unstable. I think I made that clear. Uh, but then the map is very stable. The maps in the school shows. Uh, a map as if we've already annexed that space. The, this, and, and all of the maps look the same. Um, they show a, a reality that doesn't exist. And, and that is the, the reason for, um, for this project, uh, the, the, the first reason for this project. So um, it's the map, it's the, it's the study books, 
um, there's something we need to do about it. Now, it's important to 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 note this map is not. Uh, if we compare it to Google Maps, Google Maps shows a lot of borders on its maps, and they're all dashed. If you try to look at Google Maps, you don't really understand where Israel is. We had to decide where Israel is, and uh, to do that, we had to draw one line. Um, the green line is actually not a line; it's lines. So many of them. Uh, repeat themselves. So with the Golan Heights, because Israel, uh, we decided that our approach is what does Israel, Israeli governments, uh, the, the current Israeli government think that where Israel is, right? Uh, the Israeli law. Israeli law has annexed the, the Golan Heights, even though most of the world does not accept that annexation. Uh, we included this we, within the line. Now, when it, when it comes to the West Bank, um, that is more complicated because, um, as you can see, there are multiple lines, as you can see on the left, uh, multiple green lines, but there is a certain line uh, that is more explicit um, in our map, and that is uh, the sovereignty line. The sovereignty line, uh, that, which is the one line that we decided to embolden, is, is, is the line that shows um, to what, uh, where does the uh, does Israeli law, um, what areas are under Israeli law? So th that line me means it continues into East Jerusalem, even though no other country actually accept that. Um, but but this is an Israeli map. It shows Israel's perspective. At the same time, it shows that that our our sovereignty actually ends in the middle of what we thought is still Israel. Um, we got some, um, some black for that. Um, I'll, um, I'll finish that, that part and, uh, and then hopefully we'll get uh, to, con to, to finish it. Um, uh, anyway, um, we got a lot of, a lot of media that, it, well, basically the Ministry of, Edu of Education, as soon as they've heard about, about that map, they've declared that we are not allowed to put the maps in classes. Um, and uh, this pretty much blew up. Um, you can see the Washington Post writing, Tel Aviv allowing kids to see Israel's actual borders shouldn't be controversial. Um, um, who's afraid of the Green Line? And nobody actually knows where Israel ends and Pal Palestine, Palestinian territories begin. We're trying to answer that question. Uh, apparently, the mapping uh, center of Israel does know where, where Israel uh, ends because they published this map. And this map actually shows where do Israeli courts have a jurisdiction? And that is identical to our map. And so uh, as much as Israel uh, is trying to ignore that, it is, it can, we cannot talk about, a, a, about law in Israel without acknowledging space, but it's an image, and this is uh, relevant to, our, to, the, to the topic of our, of our panel. This is an image that was hidden and it's a powerful image. I'll, I'll finish with a tweet from um, Chen Arieli. Today, maps with the green line will be hung in all classrooms in our city. The reaction of the Ministry of Education is disgraceful, and we continue as planned. Boys and girls deserve to grow up with a realistic and uncensored sense of place. This is a project we have been working on for two years, and I am very excited and proud. So. Um, hopefully, I will get some time for the third part. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Sorry for taking more time than I should have. Thank you. Thank you, Mushan. I understand. I mean, it's a very complex topic. It needs time. Super. Um, yes, we still have time. Um, so, Anjales, uh, I would say that you could share your um, presentation with us. Um, for everyone, please ask your questions. We will also have afterwards the possibility uh, to maybe discuss <laughs> further and look more into Mushan's uh, thoughts and other projects. And uh, yes, and otherwise, just follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, YouTube, and let's continue the conversation afterwards there. So let's just keep on the discussion. Okay, Anhales, so very curious to hear. Thank you, Darian. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and have the chance today for sharing some thoughts over visualization as a um, tool 
as I call entitled this presentation, visualization as a research tool in activism. So before starting, just to, to say that this presentation is not gonna be that visual. Uh, and also because I want to share with you that uh, when Darian invited me to do this presentation, I I really thought about what to share with you today. Um, and I'm I want to be very um, honest with the type of work that I'm I'm showing today. That makes me thought that actually um in my data activism field, let's say, I I'm working already on projects that I can't share today. Hopefully uh, I can share them uh, on March next year. But I want to share more or less some of the parts of the process of designing with data in which I've been involved in activism. So that's why today I want to share ideas related to visualization as a research tool, not that much into communication for wider public. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm coming from Chile and I moved to Milan eight years ago because I started doing my PhD at Politecnico di Milano within the Density Design Research Lab, which is, um, we are a group of uh, research group within that design department at Politecnico di Milano. And uh, we do research and we teach also on different uh, dimensions of data visualization. So um, now I'm I'm still working at Politecnico as a, a research assistant, and also I I teach within the, the course that we hold with Michele Mauri, Gabriele Colombo, Stefano Singale, and Simone Vantini, and uh, the amazing crew of assistants. So this is just for showing you the link to the to the, our course project where we focus a lot on topics related on algorithmic mediations and uh, and so on so i also have a i i also participate uh, within of topic which is a um, political collective based in milan where we do a research from grassroots research in order to inquire different topics of how the city of Milan is changing. And we usually try to do this based on data. And finally, in the last years, I, I start collaborating with a um, non-profit organization, which is called Equipo Argentino de Antropología Forense. And they, they, have, they use a um, forensic approach for dealing with investigations related to forced disappearance of people um, they are spread around more than 60 countries around the world, but I, I've been collaborating with them specifically on Mexico, Nicaragua, and Argentina. So after telling you how I split my time on different things, I, I want to share with you two main ideas during do, through this presentation. One is that um, I believe that visualization for activism needs another approach, not only the aesthetical one, but they need also to disclose the design processes of data and the visualization. And the second idea I will introduce today is about uh, visualization as a research tool in activism, as a toolbox for unpacking, transforming, and using data, and also um, sharing the, the practices of data, not only that visualization as an output just for representing something, but for involving activists on the process of bringing um, counteractive uh, or counter information through data visualization. So I will start with this first point. Um, for doing this, I will present you very briefly what I did uh, for my PhD. Um, my research is entitled Disclose to Tell, a data design framework for alternative narratives. I was inquiring which is the role of data visualization when it turns into um, into trying to bring narratives that counteract hegemonic powers. So for doing this through the, the, the thesis, I will not make a dissertation today about the thesis, but I heavily based one part of my research looking into cases of how data visualization is, is performing on data activism. 
So I um, I define alternative narratives as um, uh, as data driven stories that are using data for bringing facts for telling a story that is not being tell um, or that it goes um, that counteracts hegemonic power for different reasons but they are using data for bringing evidence and telling something that is not being told so in this case this type of uh, narratives are tools of the conflict since they represent them and also tools for the conflict because the idea of bringing these stories is not just only depicting an image for telling a story, but also for promoting a critical questioning of the causes and audience of the conflict. So uh, I start from, I collect like around 120 cases, but then I realized that not all of these cases were filling up what I, I wanted to see, exactly types of projects that were counteracting hegemonic power. So based on the theory of Chantal Mouffet and also Carl Di Salvo, I, I defined this sort of criteria that it's I call spaces of confrontation. So I took a look over each project to see if they were answering in somehow to, if they were revealing something that was hidden, if there was um, a strong component of dissent and contestation. And this was super interesting because actually I find out many projects that are quite close to the same aim, but they're not like answering to contestation, dissent or, re or revealing. So um, it was interesting to find out that there are many projects related to digital social tools, for example, um, that are not contesting or they're not revealing anything. They're just like helping citizens to uh, do citizen science, for example and so on. So I need to take an overall look to all of these cases and I start looking into each of each project, uh, answering to, to different things such as who are the actors involved in the project, the aim, the purpose, the motivations, but also the, um, the way in which each project collects data and the different processes that the people behind each project uh, pursued for bringing up these projects. So um, that's why I finally create like a parallel thing of the thesis. This archive, since I want to share about, I want to share the projects, not because I discovered them or because I designed them, there's no uh, merit of me in this, but I thought that was a good idea to share the collection as a collection, since I, um, I found out two things. One is that many of these projects were getting offline or they were like quite old, like from 2005. So they were built with technologies that were not like working anymore on the modern browsers. So it was a way of um, uh, keeping a look into projects that constitute part, an important part from my point of view about how this type of story driven, um, data driven stories are, are happening. And at the same time, um, I wanted to share and start a discussion since talking with other activists in other fields, not design, I realized that many of them didn't thought about the, um, the good uh, practices, not good practices, but the good um, partnership that could be done with designers that are working with data and how different uh, type of, no, not types, but different activists, activists coming from different fields can put together and start using data visualization as a way of telling uh, their own uh, stories. So from this, I just want to make a, a recap that even if many of these projects define and declare that they were looking for transparency and opening information and so on, I, I took a look over them and I saw that many of them actually uh, we're having a weak relationship between open data culture and data visualizations. Many of them didn't declare any type of license about the data or about the project. Um, so where there was also a lack of will to share the data due to other reasons not explicit in the projects. So this brought me to think that um, when we are talking about data visualization for activism, the aim is not only to provide a message, but to make people to inquire the way that message is being built. So um, what I, I think really 
I, what I, I believe is that visualizations for activism should also carry their own story about how that visualization was built. So to bring in the visualization metadata, let's say. So this could be a different section of a website project that is describing and explaining uh, the motivations of, on how you design the project, how you choose different parts of the data set, what parts you exclude, what parts you include, which types of data transformations you do. Because every decision you are doing while you are creating or you are designing visualization is a way of creating knowledge. So these are some cases. I believe this is one of the, uh, the cases that works very good on disclosing their design decisions. It's a project done by Off Topic. Um, and um, there's a section that is precisely for uh, presenting the different decisions that uh, the collective took in order to create the project. And uh, this is not only about describing decisions, but also sharing and making available the tools, the different data sets, the different material, raw material. Since the idea that um, it's behind this is that um, to, for, for turning the message into an active reflection is by allowing individuals to take them and to alter alter the the the, 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 um, the visualization itself. So it is through using and putting on practice you the way you can inquire and know much better about the interpretation of this specific conflict. And this is something that we are also trying to, to bring into our teaching um, with our students at Politecnico de Milano, that is also to make them reflect about their own processes when they are building this sort, this type of data-driven stories, to think about their process and also to make it transparent and share how different parts that are important parts of the, of the design process, such as the data definition, the scraping methods, the different data transformations, and why not making available the data sets uh, that you use for building the project in case it's possible to share. So from the second um, thing that I want to present today is about visualization as a research tool in activism. And here I, um, I wanted to tell you more about, uh, I want to share some experiences that I've been, that I have with the um, Equipo Argentino Antropología Forense. They, um, um, how can I say? I have the, the honor to, to work with them uh, first on a process that was about um, providing workshops on data visualization for um, different actors that are around the topic of forced disappearances. And this is quite specific to the context of Mexico. So they, as an organization, realized that they needed more tools for improving the way they are already doing a very complex research on forensic um, topics and forens using forensic methods, but they needed more tools for also collaborating and organizing the data. So I carry out some workshops with them. Um, four of them were for people that are already from this organization. They're very trained people coming from the scientific field. And also they invite other human rights organizations and journalists. So people that are really trained and really prepared, but not, not that much on working with data. And the most challenged uh, workshop was one for the family members of um, disappeared people. Um, so in total, there were more than almost 100 participants and the workshops were very tough, like four or five hours for four and five days. So I wanted, what I want to share from this experience is that I, I encounter a reality that is not the... <laughs> so it's not the typical reality that I found on design with data projects uh, at the university or uh, professional projects that I, I have done previously. But in this case, I, I encounter many different actors that are uh, on touch with the same phenomena, in this case, the disappearance of people in Mexico, where there's a huge disaster related to the data management by the authorities. So there not, it doesn't exist one official data set about 
uh, a list of people that it's been disappeared. So that means that these actors are the ones that have to collect the data in somehow and start putting them together. The issue is that there are many organizations that are doing the same, they're looking for the same people, but they're not talking between each other. So in this uh, context, um, data visualization for search um, was very challenging because uh, it should, uh, I believe that uh, actually finally at the end of the workshop experience, it uh, managed to put together people that were seeking for the same people. So in, in the slide, you will see I put Buscadora, which is the name for the search, the people that are searching for, for disappeared people. So each of them were go carrying out a different way or an individual way of looking. But through these workshops and through the visualization, they start sharing information and they start Conversate, um, having a common conversation. At the same time, they realized that many of the information that they have were doubled, um, were duplicate, sorry. Uh, and, um, and somehow the, the workshop was, was more structured, following uh, the way of providing them tools for making a safe research uh, over their disappeared uh, member family and also um, tools for articulating the data collaboration and also for communicating between them and also between institutions and society. So it was um, a very strong um, experience since um, after the workshop, there was a moment for sharing what this workshop means for you and so on. And uh, from many parts, uh, even if you think it's a uh, very, not superficial, but very basic. I mean, there were people that were learning how to use Excel, for example. And from learning how to make a pivot table on Excel, they realized that they could organize much better the messy data that they have about uh, their, their family members that were disappeared. So from this point of view, this experience as a research tool is, I'm not intending to be, how can I say, colonialist. Uh, I'm very happy because this workshop were co-created with people from the organization and thinking about what were the necessities of the different actors involved in each uh, workshop. Uh, also, even if it sounds like super basic again, making people learn how to use uh, maps for example, was very useful because it was the first time they have the chance to put dots together in a map. And even if this sounds like uh, missing the, um, the human dimension of what a point on a map can, can, can mean, for them was extremely important because for the first time they could see patterns. So this is just to say that um, uh, in my experience so far on working on this field, I encounter a reality that needs very much designers that are into data and that are, um, to, how can I say, to this field of human rights need a lot of designers that have data skills and that are uh, more into putting their skills for this type of research. Also, I encounter myself like doing really very very nude visualizations um, that are uh, helping for first time to see patterns about as, uh, a phenomenon that is very, very covered by authorities. So looking at them for first time in very simple visualizations is already a way of understanding and making research in, in, this, in the field of um, digital rights. So thank you very much. And that's it thank you angeles perfect you're perfect in time that's good we're back on track super uh thanks a lot thanks for the three talks uh was really heavy stuff um nice brave heavy um so we actually i'm really surprised we have a lot of questions so i guess we won't be able to <laughs> answer them all uh i would really suggest that people uh if you ask questions and we won't be able to ask them, just ask the speakers themselves, write them, write us, write them, write into Instagram, Twitter, I guess LinkedIn, um, YouTube, and we will try to answer them, right? Okay.
So um, as we start democratically, um, and Frederica was Frederica was the first one, so she has actually most questions because it was mo most time and most time to upvote. Um, I will also ask. I will just read the first question, right, and then feel free to answer it. Free, feel free to discuss. Um, actually, the first question, which is mostly upvoted, is actually a repeating question um, because it comes over and over again um, and the question is uh, um, an anonymous person asking um, Federica um, for such a specific and beautiful visualization uh, do you build by hand uh, in a design software so do you build that in, in by hand on a design software or are there frameworks automating uh, your workflow with some freedom Okay, so it's about tools. Yes. Uh, for the static pieces, uh, I design them always using Adobe Illustrator. There are there is a tool on Adobe Illustrator that allows you to create charts, uh, copying and pasting the data. It's already it's not a plugin. It's already in Adobe Illustrator. You you just have to look for it in the toolbar. I often use raw graphs. That it's a um, online free tool, excellent tool developed by Density Design. I also, by the way, uh, did my thesis with Density Design. And it's called rawgraphs.io. And it's excellent, it's great. Uh, you can copy and paste data there, but also import uh, CSV files, and you can choose among a very wide selection of possible representations and visual models. And then I use those tools to have the skeleton, let's say, of my pieces. And then I draw on top of them custom shapes designed by me. So I have the actual representation automata, automatized, let's say. So I have something accurate, but then I can draw on top of it something that's more custom. For the interactive pieces, I work with developer and they use D3 or, or SVGJS. Sometimes I send them the pieces designed by them and they build up a, an interactive piece, but in this case, it's a more complex process. But those raw graphs uh, and Adobe Illustrator, but everything is always finalized with Adobe Illustrator for the static pieces. Oh, Federica, can I add something? That um, sure. raw graphs, actually, it was um, created by Density Design with Studio Calibro. That is important to mention all of the guys, also with a collaboration of in Magic. I wanted to say that too, but I but I realized that this, this is something for you to say. No, I think I, I mean it's been is uh, making justice for designers because many oh, yeah, yeah. designers yeah. actually we use raw graphs, and I think it's meaningful to to name. The people who provide these tools, amazing tools. Super. Yeah. And uh, Angeles Mushan, do you have a different workflow or is it kind of in the same direction? Mm. Uh, Bye, Mushan. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, I would skip the question. I think uh, let, let's uh, let, let's get to questions that are uh, that are on on the topic. On of, the topic. Uh, the okay, I see. I see. The, Mushan, it's already. Let's then jump to the uh, question which is directed to you um it says uh from again anonymous um but it says your work touches politically sensitive areas palestine would you fear your maps work would be used to serve agendas beyond educational purposes uh i don't fear that i expect that actually <laughs> yeah. um I, and that is something, you know, we, when I, when I broke the, the talk to where are we, um, I, the, the R is important, like where, not where, where we, not where will we be, but where are we right now? So I definitely would be happy to have conversations, conversations with opinions that are very different than my own based on reality, right? Mm. And, and, and the representation of the map is like, it's a map that says, this is where we are right now. We might not like it. We might feel like, if it, like it's not enough or it's too much or it should be different. But the mm. fact that we don't know where we are means that we, we are not able to have a conversation. 
Now, now it's it's interesting because Israeli law actually um, actually uh, uh, works by something equivalent to this map. It's just that the visual is not there. And 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 just a few um, just a few months before the the launch of the project. Um, there was a, a, a research that found that back in '67, there was a secret decision by the by the government that was actually de declassified recently, where they decided explicitly not to print maps with the green line. So, so it was not a mistake, um, and and that obviously made uh, the action that the municipality did. Um, much more uh, contentious. So, uh, but I, I, I think uh, as a citizen and definitely as an, uh, as education people, we have to have a public and civic discourse and political discourse that is based on reality. Now, there were, there were tons of critics for this project. None of them said that what we represented None of them presented a different reality. They presented diff different ideologies, but they have not presented a different reality. And in times of post-truth, you know, we need to cling to something. We need to have a common ground to 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 be based on. And the visual is very important in that sense. Mm -hmm. Angeles, how, I have seen you before. What did you? What's your position regarding visualization and the alternative realities and that we need them? And that kind of that you provoke conversation be below your target group. Okay, so as I present, I I'm very I very believe that from um, um from from information, you can access or you can change a lot of the conversations that are happening. So I want to say this because, um, for example, I'm I'm coming from a country where social classes are heavy. So I, I mean, they are very defined, and it's uh, very difficult to have a conversation among classes. And this is because, uh, well, different, uh, very local uh, aspects of of Chile, local uh, characteristics of how things are happening in Chile. But what I've seen and what I believe is that once different classes have access to information, they can start a common conversation, a common ground as Mushan is saying. So again, this is to say that by bringing alternatives, alternative narratives and alternative stories about what is happening allows people to start thinking about different things that no one had said before. So in the same case with the map of uh, that Mushan presented, maybe for many kids, for many generations, never they never seen um, a map with a green line. So they were, um, how can I would say, they they didn't knew the reality of a different map with a different information. In the case of uh, of Chile, I I in my, the case of where my context where I was raised, I'm I'm sure that once as uh, different social classes or different um, educational levels start having the same access to information or start talking about alternative ways of thinking, that will allow us also to make more informed decisions and also to carry out the social changes that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Federica, actually, we, we have an interesting point here. Federica, is it, how do you see that? I completely agree. I mean, uh, I, I, I mentioned visualizations as a starting point uh, for, for discussions and for yeah. also missing data or inaccurate data and declaring the missing data and declaring the transparency and intellectual honesty, the, the, the missing parts, the missing stories, I think it's very important. And I think uh, it doesn't undermine the relevance of visualizing data. I think it just starts an important conversation that has to be made. And as a professional in this field, for instance, I really feel the responsibility to, to mention it and to talk about it. So I completely agree with 
visualizing visualizing to start conversations and discussions. Completely See? agree. Completely agree. Good, 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 good. Um, so I would I would read some more questions. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Bye. Cool. Okay. So uh, actually, maybe that is connected to it because it's always also a question: How do you test? How do you test your visualizations or the perception of the visualization? Right. So how do people see that um, readability, not readability, interpretation, context, and so on? So how how do you see that point? Uh, it's it's for me. Or it's actually for all of you, I guess, all you all of testing your visualizations. <laughs> so I, I, for instance, I often mention uh, how my I test how I test almost all my visualizations, and the first test is sending them to my parents. I send screenshots of the legend. I send screenshots of the visualization while it's in progress because I need to know. Not what my colleagues can understand because I'm not particularly interested. I mean, <laughs> I love to talk to my colleagues, but that's not the main point. I'm interested in talking to people who are not in my field, especially when I'm working on pieces that have to talk to people not in my field. And so I send to my parents screenshots from the legend, from the overall piece, asking them if everything is clear, for instance. And this is the first test, the first example kind of test that I do. Uh, then from an accessibility point of view, another tool that I want to uh, suggest is Oracle, Color Oracle. And it's a great tool because it allows you to test your visualization uh, through different color blindnesses and so to see how accessible it is. So this is another kind of test I do. And then there is what I think it's very important it's to, and then another, another feedback that I have when I share things online, uh, it's to add the comments, of course, especially when the projects are widely shared. So for instance, uh, the, the one that I did in the last weeks uh, on Iran, they were hugely shared and I wasn't expecting that. And for me, it's very important to read all the comments and to also read the critiques. For So for instance, in the first one, in the first two ones, I'm, I'm mentioning that there are missing data, missing people in the caption, but I'm not showing them in the infographic. So the braid is only the red one. But then there are were comments rightfully uh, mentioning the fact that there were missing stories. Uh, and so I thought, okay, so maybe it's, it's not enough mentioning in the caption. And so I use the black bread fitted in the background in order to do that. So for instance, having this uh, feedback and reading them, it's very important for me in a project as in this one that I can, I would love to stop to update it, but now I'm updating it because that's what's happening. And uh, so reading people comments, and especially I would say people who are not in my field, but not because I don't want to listen to people that who are in my field, it's very relevant, it's very precious. But then my purpose is to communicate to people who are not familiar with this language. And so this is why for me, it's very important to read and see this kind of feedback. Cool. Um, I, I'll. I'll take on that yeah. too, maybe. Um, so, so when I was, uh, there's something I tell my students about a project that are uh, politi political, like they're, they're not allowed to say the term raising awareness in class. Like, mm -hmm. uh, unless, uh, unless it comes with a, with a wider um, um, perspective about, uh, you know, th theory of change in general. Like, what, what, what is our understanding of the power balance, and why have we decided that that we need to raise awareness, and then whose awareness raise awareness? So, what would happen, right? Like, what are we expecting to to happen next? And this is something that that is very frustrating for for designers who are trying to have some impact in in the world. Whether it's political or, or otherwise, but we, but 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 I think um, design cannot be, you know, a, a thing that kind of floats outside of uh, of the systems that that it that that it um, um, claims it's trying to affect. Now, uh, with with the map project, it was even trickier because we we expected. Um, to, to see you know some resistance 
we haven't expected that level of backlash. Um, and, uh, and especially in a country like this, um, it, this, this looks like success. The, 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 um, the public debate is a success on its own. But as far as I'm concerned, that is not the project. <laughs> the project is an educational project. The project is trying to make sure that the, the, uh, that kids in Israel would not be raised on ignorance and would have the vocabulary to understand where they are and where they want to be, right? So, so that would take much longer. I'm not sure we can quantify that, yeah. but, we, but we need to focus on what is, desi what is design trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See. Oh, Mushan, I think I, I will start doing the same with my students, like uh, avoiding saying race awareness, because uh, so coming, going back to the question, um, I must say that how we evaluate, this is a continuously conversation that we have at Density because it's super hard to evaluate our visualization projects. I mean, uh, the work we, we do in de Density di is different from the one I presented today that I'm doing with the um, NGO in Mexico. But in both cases, there's a rich research process in which uh, so you are also on the conversation with the people you are working for that visualization. So from that point of view, even if we commit many errors, uh, we are continuously questioning and doing research over that. So, I mean, it's not only about colors, about um, contrast or legibility by size of the font. It's also about choosing words. To being very careful in the, way, in the way you are also making other data operations such as aggregations or any other calculation. So to how we test this, it's a complicated question which I don't have the exact answer, but I, I mean, start being very critical with your own work and uh, doing a co collaboration, co-creation with other researchers. From, from my experience, it's been super relevant for understanding if the things that we are doing work or not. I agree. So actually, to conclude, so the testing shouldn't be the barrier to make visualizations. So kind of don't over conceptualize, just do, right? So kind exactly. of create, <laughs> create the momentum, create a, something to talk about, bring something to paper and, and, and see what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like two um, two edges. Yeah. Well, on, on, on one hand, like like be, have some commitment to yeah. what is it supposed to be in the world to do in the world, but don't think that the fact that you cannot uh, get the exact answer, kind of a data driven design pro process, which gets I don't know co liberation at the end, it doesn't work that way exactly. Uh -huh. so, so I think these are tensions that we need to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Regarding time, I'm just trying to be the timekeeper. Um, would there be some final remarks from your side? I would say the official part we could close. We, as I, we, I would like to have a, a, a exception tonight uh, to have again the possibility for the final part from Mushon to be able to finish his presentation. Um, just the discussion part, I would like to kind of close here, if you have some final remarks, and then I would say, Wushan, you, you please feel free to show us the last part where we were not able to show, where you, know, you were not able to show before. Do you have some final remarks? Mm -hmm. So far, so good? Okay, so good. Thank you. So, Mushan, it's kind of your last, the last part, please. <laughs> okay. Angeles and uh, Federica, do, do, if you think of, uh, of last remarks, you still have a few seconds. I'll, ju I'll just say, <laughs> I'll just say, I'm, 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 I'm sorry for being disrespectful of the. Of the no, of the Sean, point. don't worry. This is uh, um, so people at home. If you have to go, I understand, but uh, <laughs> it is it is actually important for me to finish this because this is the part the part about you as well. So yeah. hopefully that's a cliffhanger that would get you to to no stay. For, from my side, okay. I, I also want to to listen to your the end of your presentation. Yeah. And, and 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 Darian is going to 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 edit this as if it yeah. never happened. Yeah. Um, okay, sharing. And thank you for everyone who joined so far. 
continuing. So, so yes. we talked about, so we talked about where, and we talked about are, but we need to talk about we. Um, what do we mean by we, and how does the maps and the borders and the and and the sense of place create this we? Now, he, here is a way of asking that. So, so we're looking at the borders, and it brought us certain aspects uh, of identity of who we are, who we are not. Um, but I, but I would uh, argue that there are other ways. There's languages, there are populations, and there are, there's climate. And these are three things that are much deeper and, uh, and more ingrained than borders. As you've seen, borders are changing all the time. Languages, populations, and cl climate, not that much. Let's start with languages. So um, Tel Aviv is actually a city that uh, is pretty young. It's a, a bit over than 100, more than 100 years. Uh, but it, but it was uh, built uh, to the north of Jaffa, a, kind of an ex, a, a Jewish ex extension of Jaffa, which is a very old uh, Palestinian city that that was uh, around for thousands of years. Um, and um, so so uh, there is a Palestinian city that is a part of the same municipality. Tel Aviv uh, Jaffa is the same municipality. Um, uh, uh, the first. Uh, the first Jewish uh, Israeli city um, and uh, and the first uh, and and an old uh, Palestinian city. Now, um, Israel uh, twenty percent of uh, of um, citizens uh, in, in Israel are actually Palestinians and and they uh, and they speak Arabic. So Arabic is on signs. Uh, it's a part of of our landscape, and we live in a region where. Um, People don't speak Hebrew; they speak uh, Arabic, um, and that and that is um, and so. So, if we look at these three um, elements of the map, uh, all three of them cannot only be in Hebrew, and and that's why we actually translated the map to Arabic. Um, the the local map, uh, the city map, the uh, the state map, and the regional map. Now. Um, we actually really uh, sweated over over the, this translation because apparently, you know, Arabic is is written um, as a, as a continuous line, and when you try to break it, you can see that the lines that connect the le the letters sometimes break between between them. We actually, I worked with the wonderful Nawal Arafat, who's a um, an ex a student of mine and a dear colleague, and she actually kind of almost. Uh, metaphorically whipped me every every time a, a letter would break, and we actually stressed over every label <laughs> on that uh, street map. Um, we I worked uh, uh, now. We had other issues. Uh, Ash Ashkelon, for example, which is an Israeli uh, city, is a, is built on a very 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 old uh, um, Palestinian city um, called uh, Askalan. Uh, now Askalan or uh, El, El Mejdel um, are not names that are used anymore um, in Israel, and it's a big and 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 serious city in in Israel, and it's called Ashkelon. And we decided to translate it as Ashkelon rather than Askalan. It's a, a, and to to get back to the point that this is a map of today. It's not a map of what it was or what it would be. So that was a you know a sensitive question that we decided that we feel. Confident about the decision, and I worked with the with the wonderful Khulud uh, Masalcha on the on the translation of all of the labels in the map. So thank you, Khulud. Um, so population that's the second thing that doesn't change that that, that quickly that that would help us understand what is we. So the, the, these are the kind of maps that I grew up around. Like I, we were here, right? This small sliver of land uh, that, it, that, is, that is surrounded by huge, uh, scary countries that they, not, that they don't really like us here, and we should be very afraid of them. Um, and they have, you know, they started wars against us, we started wars against them. It's, it's not, we're not very welcomed in this neighborhood. That's, that's the narrative. And, and, and they have a lot of countries, and they're big. 
um, that's kind of, it's a map that feeds into the sphere. This is another way of looking at the map. Uh, this is the black marble. Um, and it, act, does, it, it doesn't show borders, uh, but it does show uh, at night, where is the light on? So it's kind of a proxy for where people are, right? Um, and and when we, I really like to look at the at this at the region through this map and to to, and when you look at it, you understand that it doesn't really correlate to the polygons, right? It's different. But actually, it wasn't until I saw this map uh, by the pudding um, that really blew my my mind. Like th this is um, a population. Um, 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 uh, uh, human terrains uh, by the pudding, and and what they did is they actually took a population density map and they uh, plotted it as um, as a, a, as these columns, and the, and and it gives you an understanding that I did not have before, and 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 for me it was like, oh, this is people. It's about people. It's not about nationalities. It's not about borders. It's something else. And I reached out to them, um, and um, and they were kind enough to give me access to the Mapbox uh, uh, file, and I started to play with it myself. And um, and the Matt Daniels, uh, who was amazing about about helping me with that, um, um, re really really allowed me to take the the data work and the and the work that they did on the design as an initial inspiration. So I can go and and go and you know make that map uh, a part of um, of our map. And uh, and when I looked at it, I started to see like where, where do people live in Israel? Where do people live outside of Israel? There's a, for, for example. So thank you, uh, Matt. Um, and um, and you can see that um, for example, Egypt. Egypt is empty. Egypt is not Egypt, it's the Nile. It's the Nile, people are clinging to the Nile. This is this country. You know, it's not its polygon, it's its population density. Um, and um, and when, when, I, when we look further to the East, we can see that all of these great polygons, they're empty. It's, it's you know, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, desert. Um, and and we uh, on the other hand we can see that there are some patterns and we can see that further north the the more the more north we look um, the the distribution of population is different and I looked at that and I said like I I can see lines I can see patterns w what's missing here so I worked on that map a bit and I changed it to that and then it was clear which takes us to climate. It's about the climate. It's when we look at this region, we see these are people who are cling, clinging to waters. We can see the, 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 the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, over here um, from Syria and in Iraq. And you, we can see that when there's water, when it's not a desert, there are people, there's life. And we can see we can see that with Egypt, and we can see that uh, in Israel, and Palestine, and in, in Lebanon, and so on. And definitely, when we when we look further north, we can see that Turkey is much greener, and therefore um, populated differently. And and we know this is changing. We know this is changing. We know we we get less water. We know that, that not only our region is changing, Europe is changing, the world is changing, and the and the borders that we've drew with our, with our French and the and British uh, uh, rulers, um, pun intended, um, di did not would would not um, would not suffice anymore, Bec because that that, that uh, yellow and green uh, balance that we, that we have in the map that is supposed to create uh, a conditions for the red, right for life, does not. It changes. We get more yellow, less green, and then the, there are less conditions for red, right? So, 
when, when we look at, at how Europe is changing, how the world is changing, how, how our region is changing, we cannot uh, get back to, the, to this uh, um, uh, thinking of borders as if this is the way to understand who we are. We are people who are trying to live in a climate. Now the climate is changing. It would change the borders. It would change our understanding of who we are. And, and, and that is something that I, that is in, in, in a super important notion for children to understand, to understand where they are and, and to really understand where, they, where, where would they go from there. So this is where we are. We are, we are in classes now, um, which is very, very exciting. So I think from here, we might be able to get to somewhere better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mushan. Thanks, perfect. <laughs> so, we did Thank it. Thank you very much. Is there anybody left in the- Yes, <laughs> even 85 people still there. Yay. Yeah, thank you, thank you, people. <laughs> Even even eighty seven, they are going up now. Eighty seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So for everyone who joined us so far, thank you from all of us. Thanks for joining. We're saying goodbye. I'm closing the live stream now. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good.